welcome to Ask a Reporter for another week. Uh, my name's Nathan. And this I'm Ruby. Ruby. Hello. And Ruby is here to answer all of your questions about the High Court, which is a story we did last week. Ruby, do you want to start off with just giving us a bit of a summary of uh, what your High Court story uh, was all about? Sure. So for those of you who watched the story, you would have seen um, me appeal my way up through um, my work court system, I guess you could call it, through the levels of hierarchy, which was kind of meant to be an analogy for how cases can get to the High Court. So when um, two people or companies have a disagreement about something, um, sometimes they go to a court to get the case settled. And um, if it can't be decided in that court for whatever reason, um, maybe a decision is reached that one of the parties isn't happy with, um, they can then appeal and um, it goes up to the next level court and it kind of goes up and up and up and right at the top you've got the high court which is, you know, they have the final say on everything. They're really important, they make uh, really important decisions, decisions that affect the whole country. And so, um, yeah, basically there's seven justices on the High Court, there's one Chief Justice, um, and they make some of the most important decisions in our country. And you have sent in some very important questions about the High Court for Ruby, so let's jump straight in and we'll go to Connell's right. Point Public first. And I really like this question. I think this is a fantastic question because I don't know the answer to this. I don't even know whether there is an answer to this, but let's go with it. Timothy has asked, why do they have we weird hair on their heads? <laughs> Great question, Timothy. Great question. Well, first up, that uh, hair is actually a wig. They don't all have curly grey hair done in beautiful knots like that. I like to imagine they do. But... <laughs> yeah, so these are actually wigs. And um, it is, you know, when you think of a judge and you think of a court, you think of these wigs. But um, the fact is that not all courts actually, um, you know, have these wigs in them. In the high court, in fact, they don't often wear these wigs um, and if you go to just like a low-level magistrates court they're not the magistrates don't wear wigs either but there are some circumstances some jurisdictions which means just like places in um, in Australia and around the world where they do wear these wigs we've inherited this from England and there are a few theories as to why um, as to how it all started happening but originally these wigs um, were used to differentiate um, lawyers and judges and people who were considered kind of high society they were given really important positions in oh. society from um, to sort of set them apart from the commoners status symbol that's it ah oh, would you wear a wig for a status symbol now it's hilarious isn't well, it? yeah now we just find them kind of funny to look at yeah. and the thing is the law is very slow moving and it likes its traditions it likes to you know uphold things of the past and so this is just kind of something that has just stuck around for hundreds of years and it's still around now and it's just kind of a leftover from from the past I like it I think it's fun. Um, next question is from Lucy. Oh, we've got a picture. There we go. Oh, there you weeks. go. Wow, that, that one on the, the left there is a long one. That is luscious. That'd go right down to, to your waist. I'm not sure what they're made of. I think they might be synthetic these days, but I think um, back in the day they were made of hair. Um, horse hair. Horse hair, yeah. Horse hair. Ooh. That doesn't sound like it's going to be all that uh, soft and silky smooth. No, I think they'd be pretty uncomfortable. Do you reckon you have to shampoo them? <laughs> I don't know. You know. I bet the judges don't shampoo them. Get they them would looking get, nice. They'd get the minions to do it for them. Very nice. Uh, Lucy has a question that isn't hair related, uh, which is disappointing to me, but that's good. Uh, but this is uh, probably a, a, a better question for starting to understand a bit more about the High Court. Lucy wants to know what kind of situations usually get put up in the High Court, and you can probably give us a few examples there too. Yeah, sure. So, um, like I said, the High Court deals with really important issues. You can't just, you know, get any old thing taken up there. Um, but there's there's two main ways that a case can get to the High Court. One is that it gets appealed all the way up. So it's been through the lower courts. Maybe it's been through the family court. Maybe it's been through the local court and the district court and the federal court and the court of appeals and so on and so on. And it, it ends up at the High Court. And the High Court has to grant special leave. Um, so that means that the High Court will look at the case before they officially consider it. They'll have a look at it and they'll decide whether it's worth them considering more deeply and most of the time it, they will decide that it's not so there's hundreds of cases that get appealed to the high court every every year and the high court will look through all of them and say you know what 
these 10, these 12, these are worth us looking at. The rest of them, sorry, you have to just stick with the decision that was made in the lower court. Um, so th the other way that a case can be heard in the High Court is that it does have original jurisdiction on some cases. And what that means is that there are some uh, cases that don't have to go through the lower courts. They can go straight to the High Court. And these are when they have um, their matters that have to do with the Constitution, you know, which is Australia's oldest rule book, as you would have seen in, in our story. And um, some examples that you would have seen lately, there's two big examples of this happening right now. And one of them, is to do with the nationalities of our politicians because there's a rule that says you can't um, be a politician in Australia if you are a dual citizen. No, no, no. And it's come out that I think it's up, we're getting up to eight now. Eight politicians yes, yes, yes. have found out that Lots. they are actually dual citizens and they're having to take their case to the High Court to say, look, does this mean that we have to we have to just leave, we have to like step down from our jobs or can we keep going because, I don't know, you want to make a special exception for us. Mm. The other thing that's going through the High Court right now is um, about the same-sex marriage um, postal plebiscite, which you might have seen our story about that as well. Um, and that is um, basically a big postal survey that's going out to all Australians and they can say whether they're in support of same-sex marriage or not. And um, that's being challenged by some people um, in the government who say that that's not actually the proper way to go about um, making laws in Australia. So we don't have the answers to either of those, but they'll be coming soon enough, I guess. They'll be very busy though, won't they? Yeah. Especially with so many politicians being found to be dual citizens. That's a lot of extra work. Yeah, they've really got their work cut out for them at the moment. Um, next question is from uh, GSPS, uh, Zuri from GSPS. Uh, in the court, do they vote to find out who will be the head? And I assume by that they mean the Chief Justice. The Chief Justice, right. So our Chief Justice, just FYI, is Susan Kiefel. She's our first ever female Chief Justice, which is pretty exciting. Um, and no, the answer to your question is no they don't they don't vote on it the chief justice is actually appointed so chosen by the attorney general and the attorney general is this whole other role that is actually a politician in government at the moment it's um, a man named George Brandis you may have heard of him um, and he basically chooses he he gets some recommendations um, and then he chooses who he thinks should be the chief justice and um, the difference between a Chief Justice and the other Justices, there's not many differences really. It's more of a symbolic thing. Um, the Chief Justice is kind of more, plays more of a role in the community. They go and uh, officiate um, ceremonies and things like that, um, to kind of give, give talks and um, they're kind of the, I don't know, the poster child for the High Court, I guess you could say. But in reality, their vote, um, if there is a split vote in the court and you know a certain, some, if there's an even split, like three judges think this, three judges think that, um, the, the Chief Justice's decision will generally decide the outcome of the case. So they do have a bit more sway than the other justices, but, but not a lot, they're basically the same. So does that mean that you could ask the Chief Justice to come to your school to, to work out an argument between your friends? That'd be kind of fun, wouldn't you it? You could Just, give it a go. Hey, come on in. <laughs> we need someone with some experience. Right, let's work this out. Yeah, I mean, you could give it a try, but it'd have to be a pretty important um, playground hey, argument. Hey, if, if, if someone loses a chocolate bar in a lunch <laughs> and they don't know who took it, then I think that needs the Chief Justice to work that out. Maybe. Always worth a try. Oof. That, that could get heated. <laughs> uh, Joshua wants to know from Taylor Bend, uh, why do we have a high court? Why is it special? Good question. Um, I guess the reason, if you're going to get really, you know, big thinking about it, why we have a high court is basically that someone needs to make the decisions and um, we have lots of different courts for making lots of different kinds of decisions, but it all needs to end somewhere. You know, you can have appeal after appeal after appeal, but at the end of the day, someone's got to put their foot down and be like, this is the final decision. There's no changing from this. There's no appealing this. This is what it is. And so we invented the High Court. And um, that's been in place since 1901 when Australia was federated. And um, it's, yeah, ever since then it's been making sort of the big tough decisions. And so without it, we could have disputes that kind of never ended. And so that's, that's why we need it in place. 
Vanessa wants to just, uh, know from Mark Oliphant College, uh, what is the biggest case the High Court has heard so far? Is there one or is there a few that are sort of ones that stick out in history? Yeah, sure. So. I think, um, I mean, it's all a bit subjective of, you know, what's most important because some cases will affect some people's lives more than others. But there are some that I think most people can agree are really important cases in Australia's history. And the one um, that always jumps out at me is the Marbo case. So you may have learnt a bit about this in the past. Um, that it's all, it was all about Aboriginal land rights. So there was this guy called Ed, Eddie Marbo and he kind of led the struggle for um, having Indigenous Australians recognised as being the traditional owners um, of Australia because, you know, back to colonisation, um, Australia was declared terra nullius um, by European settlers, which means that um, land belonging to no, no one. And what Eddie Marbo was saying is, it did belong to someone. There were people here beforehand, um, you know, and they and he fought for the right to ha have that recognised by the High Court. Um, and that case went on for ten years, and it wow. yeah, it ended in mm. 1992. That's some hard work. And very sadly, Eddie Marbo died five months before the decision was handed down. So he never he never got to see the outcome of his good work, but he he's remembered as you know one of the great one of the great Australians who, you know, stood up for his the rights of his people. So I would say that's probably one of the, the biggest landmark mm. cases that the High Court's heard. Absolutely. Um, there's there's a couple of others in a more recent history, um, in oh, what I've got it written down here. In nineteen eighty three there was a case called the Chamberlain case, and this was a, a very strange case where um, a woman was charged uh, with murder over her um, her baby daughter. Uh, and she argued that a dingo had taken her baby and this case dragged on and on and on and it got, got up to the High Court um, and she went to jail for a while and then um, you know new evidence was unearthed they found some clothing from from the baby and um, eventually she like her she and her family were acquitted of all charges and declared to be innocent um, and so that was the probably the biggest criminal law case that the High Court has ever heard. Mm, it was very famous at the time, wasn't it? Yeah, big hullabaloo made over that. Um, and another one that I, I I was looking through High Court cases... You know, as you do. As you do. We all do that. Practising for Ask a Reporter. Relaxing on the weekends. <laughs> looking at some High Flipping Court cases. Flipping through High Court cases. Um, and I found one that I thought was pretty interesting. This is from 1949. And basically... These two women were in hospital and both of them were having babies. They were total strangers. They, they each had a baby girl. And um, one of the mothers reckons that she took home the other woman's baby by accident, that the hospital switched them at birth. Oh. And she went home with the wrong baby. And five years later, she said, well, I want my daughter back from the other woman. And the other woman said, oh, no, no, I've got my daughter. I don't know what you're talking about, there was no mistake. And this went up to the High Court and um, like what, what a crazy thing to have to decide on, right? Like the High Court's like, well, we, there was no DNA testing back then. They're like, we can't, we can't tell whose baby is whose and you know, how, how do you resolve a conflict like that? And I just think that's a good case because it shows the kind of crazy situations that the High Court has to deal with, mm. like really tough decisions. What happened? I don't know. Oh no! I didn't read the end. Oh no! <laughs> okay, now I need to find out. I'm gonna leave. You guys can keep it amusing yourselves. I want to know what happened. Oh, that sounds tense. All oh, right, wait. We, we, we've got, got uh, someone on the case. Daniela Webb guy is googling it right now. He's he's on the case. Hopefully, uh, we'll find an answer for you by the end. So stay tuned while I'm we get sorry, through some I more questions. Mean, I didn't mean for that to be such a cliffhanger. It was such a cliffhanger. <laughs> Tune in next week and we'll reveal all. That's, we should do that from now on. We'll have a cliffhanger. We'll just give you the start of a court case and then give you the end in next week's Ask a Reporter. Mm, great work. commercial TV of us. Yeah, I know. I like that. <laughs> uh, Isabel from Mark Oliphant College wants to know, how long has the High Court been around for? Oh, right. Well, I think we... Um, I just covered this briefly in the last question, but the High Court was established in 1901 and you may recognise that year because it was also the year that Australia was federated mm -hmm. um, and a lot of stuff happened in that year. It's kind of when we set up um, a whole bunch of institutions that we were going to be governed by and the High Court was one of those. So it's been around for 117... Mm, somewhere around there. A long time. 16 years, yeah. Yes. 
So it's, it's, it's basically one of the cornerstones of our whole constitution, the uh, whole way that Australia operates. Uh, the High Court is a big part of that. Yep, yep. The judicial system, which is all our courts and law and stuff, that's one of the, you know, the pillars of our uh, modern democracy, I guess you could say. It's a very important foundation. It's been built over hundreds of years, not just in Australia, but over in the UK. Um, you know, setting precedent, setting laws that um, have developed and, and led us to where we are today. You know, it's been the product of a long, long time. Cool. Uh, Amity wants to know, um, can family matters make it to the High Court? It kind of sounds like the baby thing was a family matter. Yeah. Why? Yeah, well, I think that was that was a criminal that came through the criminal courts. Oh. But um, family, the family court definitely uh, matters can be heard in the high court. So uh, the ba in fact, the baby swap one. Yeah. Was, yeah, was a family matter, um, and so it's possible. But the thing is, it wouldn't happen very often because you've got. Um, so many different levels of courts that it would go to. So family court, you've then got the full family court. So um, all the judge, like a whole bunch of judges from the family court, will decide a case if one if one judge if the decision of one judge is appealed. And then from there, you go up to the court of appeals. And then from there, I think you go to the high court. So it is, it could steps. get there, but there's a lot of steps. Mm. There's a lot of steps, and um, yeah. it's also a very expensive thing to take a case high, um, higher up and higher up and higher up. So. If you've got a lot of money to spend and you really care about the outcome of the decision, maybe you can do it. But I think most people kind of settle with the decision that they get at the first instance. Yeah, because each step up requires more expertise and therefore more money to help, you know, fight your case, doesn't it? Absolutely. It's a lot of money. Very expensive, very, very highly paid, but very experienced people working in these areas. So that's why it's expensive. Yep. Uh, I just want to... Uh, uh, bring up a couple of people that have agreed with me that wigs are the most important <laughs> thing about this Ask a Reporter. We got a lot um, of questions. Tanisha about from Mark Oliphant College, uh, Cavalot uh, from Grange Public School. Uh, everyone wants to know about the wigs. Uh, the wigs are yeah. What are they? Uh, what are the wigs made of? We said that horsehair before. So if you missed that, uh, so the wigs are. The focus of this, obviously, and then the High Court is just a secondary <laughs> part of it. You should have done the story just about wigs. I'll try and dig up some questions that are actually about the High Court, but I do <laughs> like the wig questions the most. Uh, April from Mark Oliphant College wants to know why there's seven. Why seven judges? Oh, that's a good question. I don't think I know the answer to that. No. Well, I suppose you need an odd number. You definitely that's need important. an odd number because um, some the really important cases are heard by what's called a full bench which means all of the High Court judges have to sit on it together. And if there's seven of them, you can't have, you know, three and three, you can't have an evenly split decision. There's always going to be a majority. Um, and so that's why the full bench has to be an odd number. But as for why seven, I'm not sure. No, I know. I was just reading about the um, uh, Supreme Court in the US and, and it had a very similar thing, but historically they just appointed a certain number that they felt was appropriate at the time and, and they roughly kind of settled on a certain number and it stayed that way for, for many years. But then sometimes some are added, sometimes some are taken away. As long as it's an odd number, then you can reach a decision. So, mm. yeah, it's very interesting. Um, Ebony from Mark Oliphant College wants to know, uh, would you ever go to watch people there make laws at the High Court? Would you ever oh, go and watch? Uh, Can well, you watch? Do you know? Yes. Oh. So, this is mm. one of the... Um, one of the most important parts of our legal system is what's called open justice. And what that means is that you can basically walk into any courtroom in the country. There are some exceptions, things that deal with children under the age of 18, you know, they, they're closed court proceedings um, and in, you know, some, a few other kinds of cases. But generally speaking, you can walk into a court off the street um, and, and sit in there and watch the um, judges, you can watch the lawyers arguing with each other and the barristers making their submissions to the judge and watch the judges hand down sentences and see the criminal, you know, the accused, um, accused people sitting in their, in their witness box and things like that. Um, because of this uh, sort of concept of open justice, which means that, you know, the public should have access to see how justice is being handed out. Um, and, and that includes the High Court. So you can rock up to the High Court and you can sit there and watch things happen. But to tell you the truth, most of it's pretty boring. There's a lot of, there's a lot of silence while people read things. There's a lot of, um, you know, long submissions that don't really make much sense to anyone other than a lawyer. 
Um, you know, I did a lot of court reporting a mm. couple of years ago and most of the time you were just sitting there like, oh, what are they even talking about? Mm. And then occasionally... Mm. Well, what you get, say? Exactly, exactly. Mm. And then occasionally you get something really exciting where, you know, someone will stand up and deliver a really good speech or you'll hear someone get sentenced to jail or something like that and then it's exciting. Oh. Um, it's it's not like the TV shows. Like I, I know probably you've all seen little snippets of, of law TV shows where people get up and make these you know passion speeches and and there's this evidence and everyone goes ah and, and people faint and things like that. It's not like that, is it? Unfortunately, not. Um, uh, it well. can get it can sometimes get that way. Like if there's a high profile case, you'll get like the accused person walking up the stairs into the court and all of the media with their cameras running after them and yelling questions at them and um, you know when people get sentenced. To jail, you you watch them. They're really upset, and they can start crying, and it can be a bit dramatic. But mm. it's definitely nothing like the TV shows. That's okay. That's probably <laughs> best that way. It would be very dramatic working there if it was that every <laughs> a bit day. full on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ella wants to know: uh, Do you think being a judge would be a difficult job? Oh yes, yes, and especially being a judge mm. of the High Court. I think being yeah. a judge, any kind of judge, would be super tough. Yeah. Um, generally, judges have a lot of experience because to be, to become a judge, you um, you need to be a lawyer first, and you need to go through um, all. It takes years to study to be a lawyer, and then it takes years of being a lawyer to be a barrister. You do your bar exam, and then you um, just kind of work your way up and up and up and up. And it's a lot of work. It's um it's long hours, and it's grueling, and you're making really hard decisions. Mm -hmm. And when you become an actual judge, you're making decisions about you know people's freedom whether they should be allowed to be in society or whether they should be locked up in jail and that must be really really tough to make those kinds of decisions yeah that's the thing keeping in mind that you know you can't have a bad day because you have to make the right call every time because right. people's lives depend on it so yep if you're feeling you know emotional about something you have to put that all to one side and just um you know try and think rationally and logically about everything be tough and the decisions that you make have real consequences for people so you know it's a lot of responsibility. I agree. Uh, Zane from Mark Oliphant College wants to know why are there so many courts? Why do we need so many levels? Basically because people have a lot of disagreements <laughs> yeah. and people break the law a lot. <laughs> um, oh, no. that's, that's the real simple answer. They're all horrible. There's courts for so many things. We have courts for um, you know, for arguments between companies. We have courts for pe people who break the law. That's the criminal justice system. Um, we have courts for um, consumers. So if you buy something and it doesn't work properly and they won't give you your money back and you'll take them to court. And um, we have courts for property uh, arguments. If people, you know, sell, trying to sell a property and something's going wrong. Anything you can think of, generally, there's some kind of court or there's some kind of body set up to... Playground court. ...to deal with that. It yeah, should be a well, playground court. Kind of. I mean, like we saw in the that. story, like, you know, you go to your boss and then if they say no, you go to the next boss up and um, it's kind of like that. You have different, these, like, mini courts happening all the time in society. Mm. Decision-making bodies. Yeah, so you might go to your teacher and then your teacher might... Uh, give you an answer and you might go well I'm gonna take it to the principal <laughs> you probably wouldn't do that but I wouldn't recommend it but um, take take your teacher's word on yeah <laughs> uh, Andy wants to know uh, from Queen of the Apostles school are there people in the High Court that are like the people that argue apart from the seven people that do the judgments are there other people that work in there totally so courts are really busy they are full of people um, other than the judges uh, and those kinds of people are lawyers, so people don't just go to court and argue for their own case. If I wanted to take um, Nathan to court, for example, because he owed me money, um, we wouldn't stand up in court and yell at each other, you owe me money, no I don't. We would hire lawyers, and so I'd have a lawyer and Nathan would have a lawyer, and our lawyers would go to court and argue for us, because they're professional arguers and they're going to do a much better job than either of us would do, probably. Um, and definitely. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Then you have barristers, and they're kind of like senior lawyers. They specialise in one particular area of the law. 
and um, you call in the barristers for like a big case when you need someone who's got specialised knowledge. Um, you also have people like court officers, they kind of wander around and help with um, the day-to-day -day running of the court, you know, what order cases are going to be heard in, um, when the, the court's going to adjourn, which basically, basically just means when it's going to stop and when it's going to start again. Um, and then you've got, you know, people, witnesses that are being called to give evidence about trials and there's, there's always people coming and going, you've got the media popping in and out, the public, everything. Cool. Okay, last question we have time for. Raphael wants to know, uh, can the issues be taken straight to the High Court or do they only do appeals? And what sort of issues can go straight to the, the High Court? We did talk about this right at the very start, but you, could you give Raphael a bit of a, a bit of a recap? Yeah, a bit of a recap. Okay, so um, yes, um, they things can go straight to the High Court because the High Court has what's called original jurisdiction to hear certain types of cases that have to do with our constitution. Um, which is our big rule book um, and so they can hear really big important cases that go straight there which is for example the same-sex marriage debate that's happening right now um, whether there should be allowed to be a postal plebiscite on that um, and uh, whether dual citizens should be allowed to hold positions in the government um, but most of the time I think most of the time um, what the High Court hears is appeals and that's people coming up from lower courts who are not happy with decisions that have been made there and um, arguing that it should be heard by a higher court and that the high court will look at those and decide which of those to hear. Cool. Now, before we wrap up, we have a result from the baby case. Oh. Yes. Daniel has the results. The mixed babies stayed with the parents that they were given. Oh, there oh, you go. Oh, the baby so. stayed with the parents they were given. There you go. So... Nothing happened, really. In yeah, the end. so the court said, even if that is your child, your biological child, too bad, you're stuck with the one it. you got. What are you going to do? <laughs> Having said that, when DNA evidence came up, maybe they went back to the High Court. Who knows? Mm, they could I have don't know. finally found out the truth. Or maybe they just went with it. Because, you know, you'd know each other by then. I feel like, you know, you have grown attached. Throw your kid out just because of DNA. No, I know. <sighs> anyway. That's just our thoughts. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for sending in all of your questions on the High Court. It was fantastic. Uh, and thank you for joining us. Thank you to Ruby for answering all of your questions so well. You are very welcome. And thank mm. you, guys. So that was a silent clap. There we go. That's a loud clap. Uh, next week, join us again. We will be talking about National Threatened Species Day. Do you want to give us a quick preview on what story you'll be doing for National Threatened Species Day? Sure, so for Na National Threatened Species Day we are going to Cambodia I mean we're not actually going but we're going to look at yeah. some a documentary from Cambodia um, about some rangers over there and you know rangers who protect threatened species in Cambodia have a much tougher time than rangers in Australia because they have to put their life on the line to do their job because there are people called poachers who illegally shoot animals over there and sell them on the black market and um, those, and so the, the rangers protecting them are, are really in danger doing their job. Um, so we get to meet some of those rangers and, and learn all about the kinds of species that they're protecting and how they're keeping uh, Cambodia beautiful and pristine and protected. People putting their lives on the line for animals. Sounds good. I'll watch. I'll also host. That'll be fun. <laughs> uh, and Ruby will be there. Hopefully you guys can join us then. Until then... Thank you very much. Think of your questions for next week and we'll see you then. Ciao. Bye.